Hello, okay, we are live. All right, let's wait for some people to get in here. Hi, hi Chrissy, welcome. And I see Krista. All right, we are about to discuss estate planning. And now I know that focus a lot on budgeting and money management, but I think it's very important to understand that estate planning is a part of that. It's a part of your personal finance wheelhouse. So I'm so excited to have Krista, the Hi estate there. planning mom on. Hi, Krista. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm good. Are you staying cool out there on the West Coast? <laughs> um, I have my, my fan going in here, but yeah, definitely trying to stay cool. Okay, well, good, good. I, I wish you luck. I mean, I'm in Texas, so I'm, I'm used to the heat, but I know it's rough <laughs> for you guys over there. <laughs> true, it's true. Well, Krista, thank you so much for joining me today. I was just explaining to those who are on that I focus a lot on budgeting and money management and helping people manage what they do have. But I think when we focus on those things, we lose sight of estate planning. And I think it's this almost elusive term. So I would love to kind of hear in your own words what that means. But before we do that, please introduce yourself to my audience and uh, let them know who you are and what you do. Absolutely. So my name is Krista Hermance and I'm an estate planning attorney. Uh, I am licensed in California. So all of the information that I'm going to be providing is based on California law, but it's really great information for wherever you're located. I always recommend that wherever you're located, you should find an attorney in your state to make sure that what you want is accomplished through that attorney or with those laws in mind. Okay. So um, at our firm, we focus on planning for families with minor children. And that's really just trying to make sure that parents know that you can actually put plans in place. You don't have to be older, right? You don't have to be retiring or planning for your death to have these legal documents in place. These are actually things that you can do now and anybody over the age of 18 should have some type of estate plan in place. And you can do this so that if something ever happens, you have the peace of mind knowing that your legal wishes are documented so that whatever you want is known because without it, generally you would have a court making decisions for you with no guidance or input from you. And that's why estate planning is so important. Now, I, I feel like there is almost this kind of underlying message that in order to plan your estate, you have to have assets or maybe no debts. Can you explain if that's true or not and why? Yeah. So one thing just to really kind of set the basis for what estate planning is, because I think a lot of people have this misconception of what estate planning is. And so estate planning, when we look at it, it's kind of this umbrella and it's an umbrella with all of these different documents within an estate plan. And so you have a will, you have a trust, advanced healthcare directive or living will, you have power of attorney documents. So all of these specific documents make up your estate plan. OK, um, and, and this is what I do is I create is I help families design these plans to make sure that their wishes are legally documented. Um, so depending on your estate size, again, I said it's always good to have some type of, of plan in place, whether it's just a will by itself, depending on your, the size of your estate or a trust. Um, and, it, and it really depends on what your goals are. So we do estate planning um, for families that are trying to make sure that things stay out of court. And to do that, we have to put things in trust. Um, and trusts are not just for the wealthy, right? Trust are for any family that wants to put a plan in place to make sure that their family is going to be protected. You don't have to be Bill Gates level to have a trust. What uh, is a trust? I, so I don't mean to cut you off, no, but that no, would no, be very fine. helpful. <laughs> okay. So a trust is a legal agreement, and this agreement is created by a grantor, which is the creator of the trust, and they put specific instructions in writing to the trustee, also known as the executor, who agrees to hold legal title to all of the assets in your trust, and they do this for the benefit of your beneficiaries. So while you are alive and you have a revocable living trust, you are all three of these roles. You are the grantor, meaning you created it. You are the trustee, meaning you are in complete control and in charge over all of the assets in your trust. And you are also the beneficiary. It's all your stuff and it's there for your benefit. 
It's only if something happens, whether you were incapacitated, meaning you couldn't make financial decisions for yourself, or you pass away, that then your backup person would, what we call your successor trustee or executor, would step in and follow the instructions in your trust. And the idea is that when you create a trust, you are in charge of your stuff, right? With this revocable living trust. And so like your house, for example, let's say you create a trust and then we change title on your deed for your house. And we say, well, we're going to put your house rather than in your name personally, it's going to be in your name, in the name of your trust. And so by doing that, when somebody passes away, any assets that they own in their own individual name, they have to go through probate court to get to their beneficiaries. So by putting it in the name of the trust, it then avoids probate. And then what it allows your um, person, your executor to be able to do is to then distribute the house or whatever assets you have according to your wishes in the trust, thereby avoiding probate court. So it keeps it private, it keeps costs down, and it, it's a lot quicker than a probate process may actually have. And how is that different from a will, right? And do I need a trust and a will or is it either or? So um, it's, it's both. Um, so depending on your state and the size of your estate and what your goals are, if your goal is to avoid probate, a will by itself is not going to do that. What a will does is it tells the court, here, all of the assets that I have, I want distributed to these people, right? And then it goes through probate court and your stuff is distributed. So having a will alone isn't going to avoid probate court. And so generally what we do is we create a trust to avoid that probate court. And we also create what's called a pour over will. And it's kind of like a backup that says if anything gets left outside of your trust, it's just going to get poured into your trust rather than having to go through probate court. Okay? And so I'm assuming the issue with going through probate court is the cost associated with that. Exactly. So in California, let's say you have an estate worth $500,000. And in California, that's not very much when it comes to owning a home because we look at the fair market value of your home. So let's just say you had a house worth $490,000 and about $10,000 in various bank accounts, investment accounts, whatever it is. So $500,000 to go through probate court, statutory fees set by California are $26,000 to go through probate court. Wow. Okay. So every, so if the every state, entire is, every asset... state is different. Every state is different. California is, is, is very not probate friendly in that sense, but there's still a cost associated with it. And so it's really understanding, do I want my estate? And, and especially for, for your viewers, they're younger, right? So this is their parents, right? If your parents, if you have to deal with this for your parents, are you going to want to have to go through probate? Or are you going to want to make sure, you know, do you have a will or trust in place, you know, and, and what's going to happen? Well, and I mean, I think that example is perfect, right? What if it costs 26000 and the only asset I have in my, tr in, in my uh, will is the house? Do I have to, does somebody else have to pay for those costs if I don't want to, you know, get rid of the house or if I don't want my beneficiaries to get rid of the house? Like what happens then? Well, they have to come up with the money. So whether wow. it's selling the house, getting a loan. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and, and people, you know, this is the big misconception when it comes to estate planning. And I feel so bad for families that come to me. And I, I mean, I just had this happen. We're just finally closing the probate. And it's been a year and a half. It took a year and a half for an uncontested will to go through probate. She called me and her mother had passed away. Um, it was her and her brother. And she says, oh, my mom just had this house. That was it. And we need to transfer it to me and my brother. And I said, I'm so sorry. It has to go through probate for that to be able to, for that transfer to occur. And so that they had to spend all of this money, the statutory fees to be able to pay for this, this house to go through probate. And it took a year and a half. And, and finally title is getting transferred to them. I don't even want to know what would happen if, the, if their mom didn't have a will or if somebody didn't have a will. I'm sure that is so much worse. Well, it depends, honestly. Um, and so that's, you know, that's one of the things I think is always important for people to think about is when you create a will, if the will isn't executed properly and the, and the probate court won't accept it, it's like having no will at all. And it's really just depends on the family situation. And so what I see is that not having a will, if you just, if you have where you want your stuff to go to your kids equally, if, you know, if that's who you have as your beneficiaries, then that's fine. Um, you know, it, it makes it clear, but where I see issues is that maybe you have a child 
which happens surprisingly more than you think it would, where they go, they leave home when they're 18 and they don't talk to their parents for 40 years. And then parents pass away and then that child shows up because they want a piece of the estate. And without a will, they're entitled to it because they're, they're family, right? They're their, their kids. And so it's what we call in California intestate law. And so it's basically following that, you know, who the parents are and who the kids are, then they would receive their portion. And I, I have two cases right now in probate court where this is actually happening um, because they didn't have a will and that wow. child is coming back to, to get a piece of what they would be entitled to. Had they done a will, and said, no, I do not want to care for this child that left home when they were 18 and hasn't spoken to us in 40 years, then that would be different. Wow. Okay. Well, that's good information to know. Now, going back to the trust piece, I'm curious, how does the trust manage everything if somebody does pass away and they pass away with debt? Can you talk about that a little bit? Does that, does the trust cover that? Does it wipe away? How does that well, work? It, it really depends on the type of debt it is. Um, so you, if somebody passes away, they have in their trust what they call, we call their executor, right? The person who comes in and would manage it. I call it their VIPs. Who, who would step in to be able to manage your estate? And they would go through and they would gather all of the assets. They gather all the bills. Part of the estate is paying off these bills. And so depending on the type of bill it is, they may speak to the company and see, you know, is there some room for negotiating and trying to get some of the debt wiped away, depending on what type of debt it was, or, you know, turning in a car or, you know, it, it really depends on the type of debt, um, whether it's secure or unsecured, if it's a credit card, medical bills, and then trying to negotiate it, if it's possible. Um, I mean, that that's the biggest part is bills need to get paid. And as part of the estate, if it's, go, especially if it's going through probate and through trust administration, it the, the bills do need to get paid okay. if there's money to pay it. Right. So it's, it's, but if there's no money to pay it, then it's not like it's going to come on the beneficiaries, at least in California, the beneficiaries aren't going to be responsible for having to, you know, pay the parent's credit card debt or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's really important to work with an attorney in your state to understand, you know, if somebody passes away, what needs to be done? And what if um, the person who passes away owns a home or what if, you know, I'm thinking about my estate plans and I own a home, it, maybe I, it has a mortgage. What are my options there? So it's, it really depends on the family situation. Um, you know, some families that I work with, they have minor children and they just yesterday I had a, had a couple that I was talking with and they said, you know, we would want our family home to stay um, so that our kids could live here and that our guardians that we've chose can move into our house. And so then it would be working with the trustee to keep the home um, in the name of the trust until the kids were old enough. And so it, when you have a trust, you have a lot more flexibility because then it doesn't have to go through probate where it has to be distributed. Within the trust, the trustee is able to manage it a bit more. And so when you're doing your estate plan, you could say, you know what, I want to keep this home in the trust and have that, maybe have it as rental income and that income coming in to be able to um, pay money to my beneficiaries or what I want it sold and then that money shared equally between my beneficiaries. So you, you get to choose what you want. The trustee has a, what we call a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that, you know, that the money is being used the way that it should, it's being invested, it's making money and it's doing all of this stuff for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Okay, so that, that person or that company is basically keeping the estate going and keeping the money flowing and coming in, which is nice to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really great, especially if you have a trust with minor kids. And that's really, you know, what we talk about is, is having a trust allows you so much more flexibility. Like if you have life insurance, right? A lot of times people don't think that if they have life insurance and they list their minor kids either as the beneficiary or the backup beneficiary to their spouse, what happens to that money if your kids, if something actually happened to you? Well, if they're minors in the state of California, you can't receive that money. So you would, the guardian would have to go through court to get a guardianship for that money. And then when they turn 18, they get all of that money in one lump sum. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so with a trust, you could have a trust and in your trust, you would say, well, I would want my kids to receive money at 25, 30, 35. And then you have on your life insurance, you have your beneficiary, it could be your spouse, or it could be the trust, and the, or your backup could be the trust. And then if something happened to you and your spouse, that money goes into the trust and then is distributed at 25, 30, and 35 to your kids because that's what your instructions are. 
Okay. And now what if, again, minor kids are in the mix? Does the guardian have a, a right to take money from the trust? Would that already be laid out? Like, how do I make sure that's covered and they're doing the right thing? Yeah. So there's a few things to consider there. So when you're looking at completing your estate plan and you're looking at the trust specifically, you are going to name your executor. So this is somebody that you want to be good with money, to be organized and to make sure that you trust them. It doesn't have to be a family member. It, it doesn't have to be a friend. It could be a fiduciary, a professional fiduciary, someone that you hire to manage it. Um, but it doesn't have to be the guardian. And so you can have the the executor of your estate that is somebody separate than who you nominate as guardians for your kids. And so that way, because you could have guardians that you absolutely love. Maybe it's your sister, but she's horrible with money. It's like, I don't want her to be in charge of the money. So you list your sister as the guardian. Then maybe you have your brother um, as the, um, as the executor of your trust, and then they can work together to make sure that brother is giving sister money to take care of the kids, right? You can okay. have that separation. It's almost like a check and a balance to make sure that the money is being used the way that it should. They don't have to be separate though, but they can be. You have that ability to make that choice. I think that's very important, right? Because you know, if, if someone is new to thinking about estate planning, they may think, okay, who in my family could take care of everything? That mm -hmm. doesn't have to be the option, right? Mm -hmm. There could be a, a trained professional who could do that for you. Yeah, and sometimes that's really the only option that people have is they, they literally trust nobody in their life, unfortunately, with the money. And I mean, you hear all these horror, sto horror stories from people that say, you know, I was supposed to get money from my grandma and my uncle, you know, I never saw any of it. I, I hear that so many, so much from people. And unfortunately, people just don't know what to do in that position that they can take court action, right? They can take legal action against whoever their trustee was, that mm -hmm. if they were entitled to money and they didn't get it, you know, they have that option. And so while okay. trusts are generally kept outside of court, they're, they're kept private if there's any wrongdoing or something going on that's not adding up, the accounting doesn't look right, or you know, they're not getting the information they need from the trustee, they can, they can go to court and ask the court to then intervene and say what's going on. Oh, that's great to know. So we had a question come in. It says, if me and my husband create a living trust, can he be the executor if I go and vice versa? Yes, absolutely. So when we work with couples generally, and again, this is in California where we are a community property state, is our, our normal is to create a revocable, a joint revocable living trust. So it's going to be both spouses that are jointly um, the grantors, trustees, and beneficiaries of the trust. And then the trust, again, because it's this living trust, it works through incapacity and passing. So if something happens to one spouse, the other, tr the other spouse can then remain the trustee of the trust and still be able to use it if something happens to the, to the first spouse. Okay. Can that spouse change the terms of the trust that were originally put in place by both parties? It depends on how the trust is designed. And okay. so that's one of the design questions that we go through with clients. And that's basically the different level of trust, right? So and the different levels of trust mean a higher cost. Um, but sometimes people are more concerned. They're like, yes, I'm okay paying this higher cost because I want to have that asset protection in there that if my spouse remarries, then my money is going to my kids. They can't take that money and then commingle it with that new spouse. And then my kids get nothing, which yes. I have clients where this has happened to, um, and literally still in legal battles with, with, um, ex parents or, uh, step parents what after their parents have passed away. Wow. And, and here's the thing, if you're going through those legal battles, if you will, isn't that draining the, the money from the estate essentially, and you're just whittling down your, 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 uh, I guess, benefits, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Wow. Now I know you, we touched on life insurance policies a little bit, but I feel like someone who maybe is not familiar with estate planning may think, okay, I have a life insurance policy. My child is a beneficiary. I'm good to go. Yeah. Is that true? And if not, you know, what do they really need to do to make sure they're covered? So a couple things. Um, like I said, in California, if you're, if you, something happens to you and your kid is listed as the beneficiary and they are a minor, they can't receive that money. And so it would have to go to the court where there would be a guardianship for that life insurance policy. And I, I have a case right now where the life insurance company will not release the money to the mom. 
the dad died and he listed and had his kids listed as the beneficiaries, not the mom. And she can't get the money. She has to go through court through this, uh, through this guardianship to be able to get the life insurance released for the benefit of the kids. And even then it's going to go into a court blocked account where the mom isn't going to be able to access it. The kids get it when they're 18. Is that because a guardian wasn't set when the life insurance policy was created? Or is that just a step that doesn't really happen anyways? And people don't it's, even think about I think it. it's just something that people don't really understand is that right. kids, kids can't receive that money when they're a minor. And so it's going to go in, it's going to go through the court system to be able to basically be protected for them so that the money wasn't used um, in a way that wasn't for the benefit of the kids. Wow. But if there was a trust, and this is what I, this is what I try and, you know, preach from the mountains to, to, to parents, is that if you have a trust, you could say, well, I would want my trust to be the beneficiary. And so then instead of it going directly to the kids, which then actually has to go through court and then they get it when they're 18, the life insurance can be the, the life insurance can have the trust as the beneficiary. And then the money would go into trust where your executor would be the manager of all of that money for the kids. They can use it for health, education, maintenance, and support. So if they want to go to school, any of that money in their trust, the, the trustee can provide it to go to school. And wow. then they get it at whatever payouts that you choose. So 25, 30, 35 is kind of the, the common numbers that I, I usually go through with parents. But it really helps kind of extend that money. But it's also available for the guardians or the trustee to provide for the kids if they need it. I love that because again, you think life insurance, okay, I have a million dollar policy. And you know, if I pass away, a million dollars is just given to my beneficiary. I love that you can say, you know what, I don't want my child to have it all at once. Nope. Or even if they're not a minor, I don't want them to have it all at once. You can dictate when they get it. Exactly. Exactly. And that's really why I love trust for that reason is being able to have those specifics in there. Because like st statistics that I've heard recently is when somebody receives some type of inheritance, within two years, that inheritance is gone. And so if you have a kid that's 18 and they get a million dollar life insurance policy, is it gonna be healthy for them? Are they gonna make the right financial response, the, the right financial decisions to really kind of have that million dollars, you know, for the rest of their life? Are they gonna invest it? Or are they gonna go buy a Ferrari? Because they have a million dollars. And right. then they may get injured and then they may get sued and then they're going to come after that money that's in their account. And then the, that life insurance policy is going to go away because they were in an accident and they were at fault. Oh, yes. Uh, now, another question came in. How can you protect the trust from being contested? What does being contested mean and uh, what, how do you protect against that? So it really depends on the family situation um, of the people that are creating the trust. There's no way to absolutely protect a trust from being contested. Contested basically means that somebody doesn't agree with how the trust was executed, right? How it was signed. Um, I really only see this for older people that may have some type of mental capacity issue. So if there's like dementia or Alzheimer's or something that the family that maybe didn't get something is questioning like, well, I should have gotten something, you know? Um, and so then they can contest it and anybody can contest anything. And okay. it's unfortunate in some situations where you, especially when you're working with the family, but you can put specific things in place that if there is this capacity issue where you have, um, where you have um, professionals, that come in and check on their mental capacity and can attest to it so that if, if it ever has to go to court or go to mediation or go to a judge, then you have this professional that checked to make sure that they had capacity when they were signing and this is what they wanted to do. Okay, okay. Now, so let's just say I'm you know, in my 30s and I decide to set up a trust how often do I have to, um, I guess, work with the company that, that's setting it up for me to make sure everything's up to date? Is that something that happens like on a regular basis? What's the general guideline for that? So generally, it depends on the age of the person. So you as being about 30, um, it's really like every three years. Um, okay. But specifically, if you have any major life events. So if you get married, um, if you have kids, um, if you move to another state, um, if somebody that you have listed as one of your VIPs, if they, if they fall into bad health or if they pass away, you want to make sure those documents are getting updated. Um, okay. 
it's always good to at least look at it at least yearly. And so like for what we do is we meet with clients every three years just to review their plan. Is everybody still who you want to be guardians? Do you still like your guardians? You know, um, do you, is everybody still in good health that's listed there? And then only if they need to make changes, do we make changes at that time? Okay. Now, I know we kind of talked about this in the beginning, estate planning sounds so elusive and grandiose, but it's, it's not, it's just a real thing. But what if somebody is worried about the costs associated with setting up their estate plan? What are some low cost options available to people who maybe they don't have kids, maybe they don't have that many assets, but they do want to have something in place? So there are legal drafting systems that are out there. I'm not going to name any specifically. Um, the biggest <laughs> thing is just making sure that you read the instructions um, and execute it properly because I would say out of 10 probate cases I have right now, and so again, this is where things are having to go through court, five of them were from included plans that were completed using some type of online drafting where they weren't done correctly, they weren't signed properly, they weren't witnessed properly, and which basically just means they're invalid, right? Ooh. If they're not done properly, the courts, they're not going to accept them. Um, and so it's like they, they didn't have a plan at all. Um, and so it, it's really making sure that I, you know, if, if cost is an issue, which I completely understand, talk to a few different attorneys in your area and try and get an idea of what the cost is. See if they have payment plans. We offer payment plans for our clients. So we say, you know, you're going to pay over six months. You're going to do this monthly payment. And then at the end of the six months, you get to, you get to sign your state planning documents. And a lot of clients really like that because they don't have to put it on a credit card, right? But they're able to just budget out that money every month. And then at the end, they get their plan. I mean, I, I think we need to take a step back. And uh, you mentioned people can set up wills online, but if it's not done properly, it's almost a waste of time. You know, I think the key word here is not done properly. So if somebody doesn't know what they're doing and we can't rely on that website to, to do it for us, it's, it doesn't sound like a, a great option. But what if somebody started there and maybe brought that to you or to an estate planning attorney? Is that a, a way to start or, or not really? So it depends on the attorney. Um, personally, I won't use any other plans besides ours. So if somebody has something drafted, it's, it's, I don't know what's included in it that I would normally have. Um, okay. And so like I have a trust administration. And so like when people pass away, they, they come to us to help administer the trust, right. To make sure that everything's being followed. And so one trust administration I was just working on yesterday. I didn't draft it and it's missing a substantial portion that is relating to a beneficiary having a special need. And so now I have to read through all of this trust information to try and find something that can help me provide benefits for a beneficiary that has special needs without them getting their um, government needs-based benefits taken away because they're going to receive an inheritance. And so mm. I have to try and figure out this way because it's not included in this trust that I'm reviewing, right? But I, I didn't draft it. And so that's why my firm, we will only do ours because we know what's included and what's important. And so by not having this other stuff, like, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want, I want to make sure everything's included that we want, like all of these special provisions that if something happened, cause we don't know, right. Mm -hmm. I want those extra provisions in there. So, and, and, and it, it gets confusing. I mean, I have another yeah. case where it's an online, where they did an online one and it's like, we just, we had to go through a, a a process in probate to be able to get real property moved over. And it's just what their intention was with creating it was not what they actually created. And oh. I've had other clients where they say the questions were confusing. They didn't know what to answer in this question. And so they're putting the wrong people in the wrong, in the wrong places. Um, and so it's just, you know, it, you, you just have to you, be careful. <laughs> you get what you pay for, but also too, it's like if you're trying to save money by doing this step and then you take it to your attorney who has to fix everything, you're not really saving money at that point. And if you, I feel like also, and I see this, people say, oh, you know, I did it online. I have this will. And then, and then they just put it out of their mind. Like it's, it's good. I don't need to worry about it. 
But when in fact, it's not good, but they have this false sense of security that everything's taken care of. And so then they tell their kids, absolutely. Oh, it's here, you know, when you need it. And then when the parent passes away and the kids bring it to me, I was like, it's, it's missing three documents that we needed to be able to do the things that we need to do. And it just wasn't done. Well, uh, Chris, I know, you know, we have half an hour here. I see one more question. If you don't mind, I would, I would love to ask you. Um, it says adult son and mother have a joint trust contains cash and properties. Son predeceases mother, son dies in test date. Son's wife has no income. What should the wife do? Um, I think that's going to be specific to the state. And also I'm a little confused why the son and the mother have a trust together. Mm. So is that not common? Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Okay. So there, I find sometimes when people have this idea, there might be confusion as to actually what's going on. So it's always best to reach out to an attorney in your state so that they can get a good idea very specifically. And usually it's looking at documents, right? Understanding what's going on, pulling up the court records. Cause I have people that tell me stuff all the time and what they tell me isn't actually what's happening because there's a lot of confusion in the words of what the stuff is. So right. when it comes to wills or trusts or executors, you know, it, it does get very confusing. Wow. So well, one thing as we finish, um, so if you are, if you need an estate planning attorney and you need a referral, please um, make sure to follow me and send me yes. a DM. We have attorneys that we work with all over the country. So if you are not in California, um, then we can refer an attorney to you. Um, if you are in California, we work with clients virtually throughout the entire state. And so if you need a plan, we offer a free 30 minute phone consultation with someone from our team, just to go over what our process is, discuss pricing and tell you really why we do what we do. Krista, thank you so much. And I'm so happy to hear that you work with attorneys across the country. I think that's going to be so valuable for my audience. So please follow Krista, the estate planning mom. And Krista, thank you so much. I learned a lot here. (laughs) I got to get my trust set up. So I will be reaching out. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.